Hi everybody, I'm Samuel Temple with 1855. I'm really excited to tell the story of the Buckhams today uh, and I'm just waiting for Logan Ledman. I don't know where he is. He said he needed to look for something uh, in the library but he didn't say what. Uh, so as soon as he gets here we can get started on that story. Well, I just wanted to go check out seasons one and two of 1855, available now through the Selco library system. I'm Logan Letter. I'm Samuel Temple. We're happy to be telling the story of two individuals whose enduring love for each other spawned one of the most recognizable landmarks of Faribault. This is the story of Thomas and Anna Buckham. Their story begins in Chelsea, Vermont in 1835. Thomas Scott Buckham, son of a Scottish reverend, was born to a poor family, but one that valued education. In college, he was the leader of his class, especially excelling in arithmetic and Greek. Actually, a fascination with Greek culture would persist through his whole life. He graduated from the University of Vermont. The year was 1855. Thomas spent the next year teaching arithmetic and Greek at Mexico Academy in Oswego County, New York. It was there that he met Anna Mallory. Anna was born on October 8, 1838 in Oswego County, New York. She took great pleasure in her social life and was a cultured consumer of music and the arts. After taking a job as a music teacher at Mexico Academy, she met the flirtatious Thomas Buckham. In 1856, after a year of teaching, Thomas Scott Buckham made the choice to seek a new life in the West. His plan? To settle in the new territory of Minnesota. With generous financial aid from his father, his voyage was a journey, but certainly not a challenge. Despite his distance from Mexico University and his new friend, Thomas kept in touch with Anna. Thomas read the classics and was well versed in the Bible, after all, he cared little for material possessions other than books. Anna and Thomas bonded over their shared love for literature. Logan and I traveled to the Minnesota Historical Society's Gale Family Library during the production of this episode to investigate their collection of original letters between Anna and Thomas. In our research, we realized Anna saved the letters Thomas wrote her on that trip for the rest of her life. On September 7, 1856, Thomas wrote to Anna from Chicago and continued to write her through January. This was the first correspondence between Thomas and Anna in the State Archives. My dear Anna, I like you very much better than any other Eastern friend, but don't be alarmed, though. I promise to forget you soon enough after I get settled in Minnesota. We arrived here this Sunday morning after a night ride of 282 miles. I certainly am not selfish enough to wish you were here. For all the nasty, dirty places I ever saw, this is the nastiest and dirtiest. All the five senses equally rebel against such fare as is served up here. The women here, Anna, form a noticeable feature. We have not seen in any part of the city a single intelligent female, young or old, single or married. They like to smoke and I have no doubt would make noble politicians. I am, as ever, your sincere friend, Thomas S. Buckham. Thomas worked briefly at the Ames Mill in Northfield before being convinced by 29-year-old lawyer George Batchelder to come to Faribault. On his arrival, Thomas was the richest man in town, the town being not a whole lot. Together, George and Thomas became lawyers by reading, which is how you did it back then, and in 1858, they opened their firm in town, Batchelder and Buckham. Business is very dull. <laughs> what we do, we get paid for at a good rate, for we charge well higher than any other attorney in the county. Thomas was hard at work in Faribault, gaining experience and building confidence with Batchelder, but before long, he was back in Oswego County, New York. At his brother's commencement at Mexico University, Thomas talked face to face with Anna for the first time in years. What they discussed has been lost, but something about seeing each other in person sparked a dormant flame in Anna. By July of 1860, 
she was in love. My dear Mr. Buckham, I've thought of you every day since commencement and made several desperate attempts to write. A hint of what happened that fateful day was provided by Thomas two years later as he reminisced to Anna on that reignition. There's a strange streak of contradiction in human nature impelling us to do what is forbidden. When I told you a story one day that made it about wrong to care particularly about me, you suddenly took it into your head. You couldn't think of anything else but poor me, and being forbidden by propriety to do so was all the more reason for persisting. In fact, I have no doubt you owe your present feelings more to this natural spirit of contradiction than to any impression I ever made on your feelings. Their reliance on letters reveals Tom's devotion to Anna, as he would later claim that he generally disliked writing letters, but persevered for her. After being goaded by a niece later in his life for a more timely response, he snarked, I do not always write my answers. I practice telepathy and hope it does not miss the mark. Despite the communication hurdles, the young couple couldn't help but catch themselves falling deeper in love. I sit here alone in the parlor. Oh, I do wish I could have you with me. Just think, my darling, it will be four weeks next Thursday since I saw you. And not a word have I heard from you since. You have written me, haven't you? What shall I think if I do not get a letter on my arrival home? But I must go up to my room for that same awful, indescribable feeling comes over me. Good night, my darling. Oh dear, how wished I am. God bless you, my dear. Good night. As their relationship developed, tensions arose inside and outside their bubble of infatuation. In the 1860s, America reached its boiling point over the slavery debate. Soon, brother turned on brother in the bloodiest war in U.S. history. Likewise, the conflict prompted lover to turn on lover, when Thomas revealed to Anna his intentions to enlist for the Union in the Civil War. My darling, you don't know how wretched your letter has made me. You seem to be perched upon some high judgment seat, so distant, so cool, so fearfully unapproachable. What made you, my dear? Do you hate me quite? I beg of you, don't say one word about going to the war. Do you want to see me going to the lunatic asylum? Oh dear, your letter has nearly made me crazy. Please don't, darling. I must see you. If it is decided I cannot go west, you will come and see me immediately, won't you? I'm sure if I could see you, you would not feel so towards me. I have so many things to tell you now that I never dared tell you before. What shall I do? I must see you. Oh, my darling, don't you care for my feelings? I never shall give my consent. Make me this promise that you will not enlist or think of it till after I have seen you. I shall write you in a day or two when I am going. Goodbye, my darling. Don't think of the war. Yours in agony. The mail brought me your letter of the 5th or the 6th. And really, I am sorry you have taken my proposition so much to heart. I won't spend a word saying how flattering it is to a lone, low creature like me to have a young lady like yourself take so deep an interest in my welfare. If I were capable of dwelling on that thought a moment, I should be unworthy of the interest you take. But my dear, what would you have me do? Give up very likely the only chance I may ever have to prove my manhood to you? To say nothing of duty? Of course I would rather have me stay in your parlor. Of course I care for your feelings, Anna. More than I care to tell you now. More than I ought to, I'm afraid, sometimes. But it's because I do care for them that I propose to go. If you are going to be so foolish as to love me, I want you to find something worth loving. Would you, in your heart of hearts, rather a, a lover, a brave one, in a soldier's grave, or a coward one in your arms? That last sentence shocks me. I would rather deserve your love than have it on false pretenses of manhood. I shall not accept of less than two or three letters a week. Do you love me so much? Then you are a little simpleton. You have never been in love, and consequently don't know anything about war. Come immediately, without hesitation. My dear little girl, I see plainly enough that you are a woman and must be taken in hand and taught a little reason. It isn't best for me to go now, 
and so I mustn't. And though there's nothing in the world more pleasant than to have you ask me, yet I'm not going to let my own wishes and yours get the better of my judgment. I must begin now to take authority into my hands and to think for both of us. And you must be woman and womanlike love me all the more because you have to mind me. I cannot go at present and you must not make it harder to refuse by asking me. To be worthy of your love is something I think of even more than to do my duty. And you must never again allow yourself for a minute to doubt it. You know very well that you are the dearest thing to me that the world has, and that I wouldn't hesitate an instant between you alone on the one hand and the universe on the other. You are the dearest soul God ever created. I have known it always, but never realized it more than I do now. I love you all to pieces, my dear. And believe me, I do trust you with all my heart, fully, completely, and always. Eventually, Tom's family couldn't support his desire to enlist. So he ultimately continued to practice law in Faribault. When will the army give us a victory and the good Lord give peace? It seems too bad to write to you of love and hopes for the future while so many thousands are cut off from hope and love. With this potential personal crisis averted, Anna and Tom spent the next months rebuilding their trust in each other and their relationship. By February of 1862, Anna's mother was prodding the subject of marriage, and Anna finally brought it up with Tom. I wonder if all young ladies have so dull and stupid a creature as you to deal with. I said something in a previous letter to try to give you a hint, but you wouldn't take it at all. Are we engaged, darling? Do you suppose we will ever be married? Tom responded, nah, man, citing his economic uncertainty. When I have answered that matter and got things into shape, I shall write her as pretty a note as I can and make as many promises to look after your happiness as I think it will be safe. Finding their bond emboldened by the pathos of war, the couple looked to their future and where they would want to call home. I am so glad you didn't buy that house, and so glad you can't quite like Faribault to settle in. It is too far away, and I think I am afraid it is so cold. To satisfy me in the long run, I would like to have you come on this side of the Mississippi. I have no doubt whatever of my perfect ability to support both of us comfortably in a house of our own. Money making isn't a lawyer's business, but it's something he can do, something I know I can do. The question is where would it be best to settle down with a view of making a permanent home? And the difficulty of settling that question is the uncertainty of the time, and how the war closes, and what direction business will take. And to settle that wisely, it seems to me best to wait, as it cannot be long. But that question settled, you needn't think I feel any uneasiness as to my ability to run a house. One obstacle to the growth of their relationship in that critical early period was the technology of the 1860s. Anna and Thomas were so accustomed to communicating solely through slow traveling letters that the introduction of the telegraph was revolutionary. In Anna's case, her reception of a telegraph from Thomas in 1866 made her ecstatic. My precious darling, glory, glory, hallelujah, this is my Thanksgiving day. Faribo, 23rd. I am perfectly well and have written Buckham. It lies before me in black and white, worth more than all the gold in the kingdom. Oh, my dearest own, I cannot be thankful enough for this inestimable blessing. It seemed a delusion, but it became a stern reality, and very soon I began to take the force of the fact that my darling had spoken to me today, just as really as if he had been in the same room. It is a blessed thought. What luxury can compare? This day you have spoken to me, and I have heard you. Did you realize, darling, how happy those few words would make me? How bright the world would look after it? I don't believe I love you rightly. You are my idol. Do you know how dear you are to me? My very life? Two factors created the possibility of marriage for Anna and Thomas by 1866. One was the end of the Civil War in April of 1865, wrangling the country back into a tentative peace. Richmond is ours! Isn't it glorious? Can't you see the beginning of the end yet? I think the news we get nowadays is overwhelming. Grandfather wept. 
And Father is just so enthusiastic as anyone. The other event was Thomas's growing reputation as a pioneer and prominent figure in Faribault. Not only was his partnership with Batchelder gaining repute, but in early 1866, he became the first superintendent of Rice County's burgeoning school system. His support for fledgling educational institutions extended to Carleton College, to which he was a trusty trustee the year it was founded. Tom's position as a local icon was assisted by his idiosyncrasies. His love of long walks was partially born of his own healthy lifestyle and partially forced by his fear of horses. Either way, it meant he was often out and about, interacting with the peoples of Faribault. With his reputation and economic situation cemented, Thomas finally felt confident about the prospect of marriage. We don't know when, or how, or where Tom officially proposed to Anna. But in the Gale Family Library's files is a hastily scribbled letter written aboard a train as Tom barreled to New York. In it, he made final preparations for the marriage that would take place less than a week later in Brooklyn on Thanksgiving Day, 1866. After a decade of courting over a distance of 1,200 miles, Thomas Scott Buckham and Anna Mallory Buckham were together at last. The new Mrs. Buckham, after years of correspondence with her beloved, moved to Faribault hesitantly. She said in an earlier letter she had reservations about not only the icy climate, which I don't blame her for, but also about how rural Minnesota was at the time. There was rapid development, yes, but the state, and especially Faribault, would still be seen as a frontier community. It had only the skeleton of a fully functioning city. A prominent part of Tom and Anna's nuptials was the provision that she be free to make trips back to New York to spend time with her parents and sister. Anna's sister was described by family as invalid, which we took to mean she was disabled. Her care necessitated somewhat intense caretaking. This need will come up later in the story. Casting away her worries in pursuit of matrimonial living, Anna was introduced to Thomas Buckham's Faribault. The pair lived in a boarding house, which suited them as neither were familiar with housekeeping responsibilities. Or rather, Anna wasn't familiar and Tom didn't care how things looked. Men. The boarding home provided a stable house where the social Anna could host guests if the call arose, which it sometimes would, as she became an active member of the town. She was the first vice president of the Ladies Literary Club, which lasted over a century under the name The Monday Club, and with Tom was a charter member of the Travelers Club. If the boarding house and the town provided a physical dwelling, a piece the Buckhams were missing from their home was tiny people to populate it. That is to say they wanted children. The couple adored young ones, as evidenced by Tom teaching at a small school in the big woods and serving as the president of the Faribault Library Board. They were, no doubt, game to share their joined love of literature with the next line of Buckhams. Raised in junction with the city, they were already nurturing. Tom and Anna found they were unable to have children. After a stillbirth in 1869, their home would retain its population of two. Their love of children still standing, they continued to be warm to the ones they encountered. Later in his life, Tom would keep candies on him for handing out, and the two would invite the young ones to their festive maple sugaring parties, an event all in attendance would savor. We can't know what state of mind Tom and Anna were in when the new decade rolled around. In the last 10 years, their relationship transformed from casual conversation into a marriage, where the two were, quote, devoted to each other as few couples are devoted, end quote. In 1860, Anna was an East Coast socialite, attempting to retain a special connection with a far-off friend. In 1870, Anna was navigating a new life in a rural atmosphere with her beloved, attempting to build a home without a family. Anna was struggling to build a new family, but she also felt a longing for her family of old. After marrying, Anna and Tom no longer needed to write weekly letters to each other. Consequently, from here on out, the Historical Society's letter files grow thin. Anna and Tom still wrote often to relatives, but without correspondence between each other, the rest of their story has to be pieced from other historical records. The next step in that story was the purchase of one of the finest houses in town in 1870. Tom wanted to give Anna that proper feeling of home that she was sorely missing. Although Tom had the best of intentions, Anna's reaction to the gesture was frosty. Remember, these are people unacquainted with the ways of a broom or dustpan, so for Anna, who as a woman of the house in the 1870s would be largely responsible for its cleanliness, Tom's gift seemed more a burden than a proper home. Her husband was also a man with little care for fashion or material possession. 
The house they moved into was poorly furnished and in some areas in disrepair. For the social butterfly Anna, playing host became humiliating since she was more used to a proper gathering. The couple ate out more than they did at home, again due to their lack of experience. The house and its responsibilities became a source of tension for the couple, an issue they would never fully resolve. Tom continued to serve the children of Rice County as superintendent until 1872. It was then he became a delegate for the Republican Party. He cast a vote among the tidal wave of support for eventual president, hero of the Union, and all-around bearded man, Ulysses S. Grant. Anna and Tom not only discussed issues and candidates, but freely disagreed with each other. This was a definite break from the norms of the time, when women's suffrage was still gaining momentum. In the coming decade, the movement would build in Minnesota, with Anna seeing the right to vote in her lifetime. But she was among the free thinkers long before she was a legal member of our democracy. In 1873, the legal members of our democracy elected one Thomas S. Buckham to serve in the Minnesota State Senate. He arrived January 6th of 1873 and represented his constituents until 1876. During Minnesota's 16th legislative session, Thomas was chair of the Judiciary Committee, a member of the Economic-Focused Retrenchment Committee, and a member of the Railroad Committee, where he drew up the first railroad regulatory bill to be signed into law in the state. In the 17th session, he resumed his positions, but swapped out dower retrenchment for a committee near and dear to his heart, the Library Committee. In addition, he represented the deaf and blind schools of his hometown by joining the Deaf, Dumb, and Blind Committee. Awful as the term dumb is today, in the 1870s it was the accepted word for people with a range of medical disabilities or those who were differently abled. He further attempted to assist that wide-reaching and oft-misunderstood community by later being an influential advocate for the Faribault State Hospital, which played many roles throughout its existence to help those with conditions that were scarcely treated by practices available at the time. In 1876, with Thomas out of the Senate, the Batchelder and Buckham legal team combined with Medelia lawyer Thomas Rutledge to defend the most notorious outlaws of the 1870s. In September, Thomas Buckham and George Batchelder made face to face with their clients, Cole Younger, Bob Younger, and Jim Younger, former members of the James Younger gang and failed bandits of the famous Northfield bank raid. The Youngers were charged with four capital crimes, including murder and robbery. Using a legal loophole present in the young state's laws, Buckham and Batchelder realized the men could escape the death penalty and instead serve life in prison by simply pleading guilty, which they advised the outlaws to do. Buckham's participation in this high-profile event made him even more of a local figure. Outrage over the Younger Brothers' escape from the death penalty led to the closing of that loophole. In the next few years, Thomas became the second mayor of Faribault before beginning a 31-year career as district judge. Having been in Faribault since 1856, he said he had seen pra practically the entire development of the city. Thanks, Tom. There began to simmer a sense of reverence around the name Buckham, as he would eventually be dubbed the Sage of Faribault. Thomas was the Sage of Faribault, but in 1878, he was a sage abroad. He and Anna's mother visited England, Paris, and Scotland. The next year, Anna had a jolly little jaunt of her own. But something was the matter. My dear Tom, you will discover by the intermission of dates that something has been the matter. It was a big thing, I can tell you. You won't believe me, I know, Tom, but I have a grave confession to make and may as well out with it at once. I have been seasick. There was a tickling in my stomach. I violently arose and made a beeline for my stateroom. The general uh, said, you going down, Mrs. Buckham? And, and I abruptly replied, yes. And he, against my wishes, kept hold my arm and assisted me down. And we struck a queer gate and, and he objected to my going so rapidly, but I was not in a mood to discuss ways or means. And my greatest desire at that moment was that he would leave me alone. Well, do I need to tell you anything more? I reckon not. Your imagination must supply the rest. With Tom's position as district judge, his influence in the area continued to grow. Outside of setting legal precedent, he also donated heavily to charities, traveling nurses programs, and invested in local businesses. The Buckhams also gave considerable funds to the Mallorys. 
Working to retain the relationship with Anna's Eastern family, they volunteered to help pay for the education of their nieces and nephews, they paid her parents' medical expenses, and Anna did take trips to visit her parents and sister regularly. Told you would come up later. We're not sure when exactly it happened, but illness struck Anna's family in the early 1900s. In what we believe to be 1908, she left for a prolonged visit to New York to tend to them. As we said before, her sister needed intensive care. When she got sick, it became Anna's job to step up and be there for her. Anna's elongated absence of what ended up being 20 years can bring into question her devotion to Tom. After researching their relationship and digging into their personal correspondence, we don't interpret it that way. Here we see a strong woman who uprooted her life to be with her love, with her new family, in a place that from where she came from seemed culturally desolate and potentially dangerous. The only draw to Faribault, and the only thing keeping her in Faribault, was her new family, Tom. When she discovered she was unable to build that new family, the only safe haven she had in this foreign land was Tom. When her family out east became vulnerable, when the only family she had was under fire, she channeled her strength and fought to keep them alive. Anna Buckham was no quitter running back home. It is our understanding that Anna Buckham was a fighter. Anna's biggest fight kept her from Faribault and Tom for 20 years. Their devotion to each other never died, though. Sources say they wrote letters back and forth every day. Speaking of Tom, it was said he, quote, watches eagerly as any 20-year-old lover for the Daily Letter. We couldn't find any of these letters on file at the Gale Family Library. Could mean they've been lost to time or that they're simply unavailable to us. The conversation of the lovers during this period was only known to them. If Tom's more eccentric nature was before tethered by Anna's grounded sensibilities, in her absence, he was set adrift. Retiring two years after her departure, it very quickly became a lonely life for the sage in Faribault. It was said he spoke to newsboys daily. He never owned a car and was never much of an equestrian, so he walked wherever he needed to go around town. Quite a task for a 75-year-old in Minnesota winters. On the occasion he had guests, he became pitifully overjoyed, always having a jar of hospitable candies at the ready. While Tom never lost his intelligence, his stature, or his wealth, life did grow weary for him without his family. In his daily letters to Anna in 1928, Tom neglected to mention that he, a, a man who rarely fell ill, became very sick. Minimizing his condition to her, he worsened until he was moved from his home to be cared for in the Brunswick Hotel. Finally, in letters dictated to his nurse from his bed, he shared the full scope of his debilitation with Anna. After two decades away, Anna needed to be at Tom's side in his final moments. She rushed to be with him as soon as she could. Thomas Scott Buckham passed away on April 22, 1928. Anna Mallory Buckham arrived in Faribault one day later. Several weeks after Tom's passing, Anna's sister followed, and she was unable to be there for her either. Anna felt she had failed them both, that she had failed all the family that she had. There can never be such a long anticipation of death that it does not come very suddenly at last. Tom's funeral put on display the impact he had in the area. Countless lawyers, judges, and local leaders paid tribute to him. He was praised for his even-handed sense of justice. Some saying Jew and Gentile stood alike before him. Dr. Cowling, president of Carleton College, spoke at the service. It was a culmination of all of the lives Tom touched during his tenure as the Sage of Faribault. It was not, however, the final legacy of Tom as a man. Anna had arrived in Faribault after Tom's passing, expecting to confront an empty home. Tom did not let that happen. When Anna stepped into the house that had once filled her with dread, she found an entirely new dwelling. New carpets, new paint, new furniture. 
In her absence, without letting on that he was doing so, Tom had furnished the house to be one that Anna could proudly call her home. Accounts say, quote, she nearly collapsed when she saw what had been done to please her, and many times after spoke of it with tears in her eyes and trembling tone, asking why she had not been told, end quote. While she had been away, Tom had made a home for Anna. And home for Anna, it would stay. She spent the rest of her life in Faribault, improving the house as Tom had been doing for years. She bought a car, collected art, joined the Congregational Church, and took an active role in a literacy club. Tom, still looking out for Anna, afforded her this lifestyle. Unaware of his exact wealth, he had unwittingly left her in a state of three million dollars, over 43 million dollars in today's money. Not exactly chump change as the nation veered into the Depression. At long last, Anna had a home in Faribault, just without her beloved Tom. It was her now, in a lonely house overlooking the town. In her view was a livery stable that crowned the end of Central Avenue. She would often remark, If only we could do away with that livery stable that annoyed Tom so much. Remembering that she was a bona fide millionaire, she bought the land for $20,000 and did away with that livery stable. What she placed in its stead was monumental. Anna had been tossing around the idea of some sort of memorial in Tom's honor. When she took possession of the land at the end of Central Avenue, Anna drew on the love of literature that had bound their relationship together and got to work. In the spring, I will begin to fly into preparations for the memorial library I am building to perpetuate the nature and work of your Uncle Tom. In about half a year of construction, 5,224 limestone blocks and $239,000 were used in the library's creation. Their nephew Charles designed the building and a Carleton art professor painted the murals. Both artists drew on Greek influences, reflecting the deep admiration Thomas had for Greek culture. Other artists involved in the crafting of the library included the world's greatest stained window artisan and local legend Grace McKinstry, who painted Thomas, George Batchelder, and others. The cornerstone was laid on September 22, 1929, and Anna's grand gift to Thomas became a part of the town's legacy when it was presented to Faribault on July 20, 1930. Anna lived to be 96 years of age, passing away on February 27, 1935. Anna was laid to rest in Brooklyn, New York. When that happened, Tom's remains were moved from their original resting place in Vermont to be with hers. This time, it was Tom who left his home to be together with Anna. This time, they would stay together for eternity. Before her time on Earth had ceased, Anna spent many hours in the library she had built for Tom in this home they could finally share. Joining Anna were the children of Faribault. Anna and Tom spread their love of literature, their fascination with other cultures and the arts to the next generation and the next and the next. The love between them has now fostered a neighborly love between every individual that passes through those library doors. This was more than a memorial, more than a donation from a wealthy local family. This was Anna's final love letter to Tom. Yours as ever, and ever yours. Yours so lovingly. My dear Anna. My precious darling. Logan and I would like to thank Steve and Kaylin for those wonderful portrayals. It was really a great experience to put actors into uh, 1855 in a substantial role for the first time, and you were the perfect people to do it. Thank you. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Minnesota Historical Society and the staff of the Gale Family Library there for uh, providing the fantastic resources, the original letters that were really the backbone of us understanding uh, the Buckhams. We would also like to thank Sue Garwood and everyone at the Rice County Historical Society for their resources and their continuous help. Uh, we'd also, of course, like to thank Sam Dwyer again for providing us with his fantastic musical services. We'd also like to thank Paul Panoski at Parks and Rec and Delane James from the library for organizing our time here. And of course we'd like to thank our parents who as always have been patient and helpful and 
assisting us in this process. And they're probably really tired because they were just filming for 12 hours. I think we're still at 11. 11? Wow. Well, we could take a while with this. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. We'll see you next time if we don't retire. Okay. Uh,